Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Winfrey, and what you're about to listen to is an, uh, a re-aired episode of one of the podcasts I used to host called Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. This particular episode originally aired August 22, 2014, and features myself and Mark Radlich discussing the villains of the WWF's Attitude Era. This is a fairly... It's a fondly remembered moment in time for professional wrestling. I think there's a bit of rose-colored glasses that goes into that, but some of that might just be me being a bit of a contrarian by nature. I am something of a curmudgeon. Uh, This was another part of a fairly extensive look that I took into the world of professional wrestling for Everyone Loves a Bad Guy. Uh, Just recently, we re-aired our episode on the WWF's boom period in the 80s. There's a few episodes of this series that I don't know if are uh, are going to be re-aired or not. One on the Territory Days, one on ECW, one on WCW, one specifically for Bobby the Brain Heenan, one specifically for Rowdy Roddy Piper. So we covered a lot of ground in this one. Uh, A lot. And this one is Mark and myself talking about the Attitude Era, so there's a lot of discussion about the character of Mr. McMahon. But he's far from the only person we discuss here. Uh, It's not one of the longer episodes, but it's still a good conversation that Mark and I have. So I thank you very much. Uh, Before I throw it back to my past self, please do like, comment, subscribe, give us a star rating, give us a written review, whatever is applicable to the uh, platform you're using. Please help us out with that. And if you've done all that already, please share. Uh, A single social media post makes a lot of difference to say, hey, I like this. Uh, You might have friends who are interested in it, or you might find other people who are suddenly interested. Or if you know someone in real life, uh, point them in our direction. We appreciate that very, very much, and I thank you in advance. The other bits of uh, housekeeping we have to do here is to thank our sponsors. First up, let's talk music, because the Attitude Era had some of the... I, I can't say the most iconic theme songs in professional wrestling history, because that's somewhat debatable. But I don't think we ever had quite the same concentration of quality uh, that, uh, that we had at that period of time. I, I do feel okay saying that. So if you want to relive some of the old wrestlers th- wrestling theme music or songs that were the theme songs to wrestling pay-per-views, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you can do so on Amazon Music. They have an extensive, almost exhaustive catalog of streaming music properties. You can also find podcasts and other audio format, uh, other audio properties there as well, including this show, potentially. If that sounds interesting to you, there's a link in the description, or you can type in getamazonmusic.com slash W2M network, and we are giving away a free, totally free, 30 days of the Amazon Music uh, Unlimited service. You have access to their full catalog. It's over 70 million songs deep. Uh, You have podcasts on there as well, as I mentioned. Just Type that into your search bar or click the link. Fill out the form that lets them know we're the ones that sent you. I know the URL helps, but let them know that it was us. That helps them. It helps us. It helps you. You get the best streaming service for music on the Internet for free for a full month. After that, if you'd like to, you can keep it for the regular monthly fee. If not, well, you lost nothing. You got free music for 30 days. No downside. Our other sponsor that I have to thank is Grammarly. Grammarly's AI-powered pro- uh, for you. Sorry, I went into the wrong part of the ad copy. <laughs> for you, listeners of this particular podcast here on the W2M Network, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. Grammarly's AI-powered products help people communicate more effectively. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free on Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and nearly anywhere else you write on the web. There's a lot of places. Other in addition to those. Grammarly corrects hundreds of grammar, punctuation, and spelling mistakes while also catching contextual errors, improving your vocabulary, and suggesting style improvements. I say this frequently, it's the contextual errors. It really is. That's what kills you. To download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash W2M network. Once again, that is getgrammarly.com slash W2M network to download Grammarly for free. If you would also like, there's a link in the description below. You can click that just as easily as typing it in, maybe more so depending on your device. All right, that's it for our sponsors. Thank you all very much again. I'm going to throw it now to past me and Mark talking about all the great heels of the WWF's Attitude Era.
When the devil is too busy and death a bit too much, they call on me by name, you see, for my special touch. To the gentleman, I'm his fortune. To the lady, I'm surprised. But call me by any name, any way it's all the same. I'm the fly. of Everyone Loves a Bad Guy, my personal podcast, my pet project here on the Radlich and Broadcasting Network, focusing on all the villainy that you love across all the media applications. I got a lot of them. And tonight we are continuing our trek through the wonderful world of professional wrestling. Eh, wonderful sometimes. Sometimes, uh, not so much. Like some of the time period we're going to be talking about today. I'm your host, Robert Winfrey. Uh, Thank you all so very much for joining us. I understand you have choices for podcasts, and you chose mine. And you are cho- you know, you've chosen mine. Hopefully, you enjoy it. Thank you for doing so. Thank you for telling your friends about it if you think they'll enjoy it. And uh, you know, just growing the brand here at the Radlich and Broadcasting Network slowly but surely it would help if Blog Talk Radio would settle on a way of measuring listens. Because I don't think I've lost <laughs> over 900 viewers in the last six months. But hey, what are you going to do? All no, right. no, that is indeed possible. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that many individual people. But uh, you may have just heard him. Mark Radlich is here with us because he's a big fan of the then of the WWE, big guy in the world of professional wrestling, so much so that he's consistently on a wrestle cast over at the Casual Heroes. And he likes this particular time period in the history of the then World Wrestling Federation that we'll be tackling tonight. So everybody, welcome back, Mark Radlich. How you doing, Mark? Hey, Robert. Yeah, it's, it's one of the... <laughs> It's one of the few. It's one of the few eras of professional wrestling I can talk about intelligently. You know, everyone remembers uh, all this old stuff. I have to go back and watch the network and kind of refresh my memory. But the Attitude Era was recent enough that I still remember a lot of it. Yet far away enough that I can say, "Oh, you see, I'm an expert of that time period." See, so uh, I'm your Attitude Era guy. Oh, I'm very glad you could be here for this. I. I'm still kicking myself for not getting all of my school stuff sorted out in a timely fashion, because I could have had Gavin Napier on to talk about Bobby Heenan last week. But that's on me, and I'll potentially revisit that later, because Bobby Heenan's awesome. I have wound up disagreeing with the article on 411 Mania that compared Heenan to uh, Paul Heyman, asking who was the greatest manager ever, and he contended that Paul Heyman had surpassed Bobby Heenan. I disagree, but I also made my point about that. Anyway, so... 90s time for the World Wrestling Federation. This was uh, this is not a time period look ba- looked back on all that fondly. I mean, you have the actual uh, kind of we call the Attitude Era, but there's a space in time with kind of the li- the departure of Hulk Hogan and the product remaining very cartoony. That you is, are of course uh, referring to the new generation. I don't know how everyone refers to all of these individual things, but I'll go ahead and accept no, that correct there. No, that's what it was. There was the period after the Hogan era, uh, but before the Attitude era, was known as the New Generation. That now, was is what it just me? There was this kind of terrible in a lot of ways. <laughs> I mean, not every way, but just as a general rule. Well, look, you had on the one hand the rise of Shawn Michaels. Bret Hart was your top baby face. The Undertaker um, was the Dragon Slayer and kind of came into his own during this period. Uh, you also had Yokozuna as one of your um, one of your main uh, really was the big heel of the company at the time. Um, this is also the rise of the Click. Um, this is where you got you know they, a lot of talent left and a lot of talent left for WCW and um, a lot of WCW talent came over um, and these guys were all mid card or low card 
Um, these were people who had been wasted in terrible gimmicks, and they came over in the WWE, and, they, and WWE made them over, and they became successful uh, wrestlers. I mean, there would have been no NWO uh, unless Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, both members of the Click, had come over from WCW and been successful in the WWE. I, I still don't understand how Kevin Nash decided to leave the successive gimmicks that he was given in WCW that included Oz and Vinny Vegas. <laughs> yeah. I I mean, come on. Come on, Kevin. You left that to be Diesel. Poor poor decision there, my friend. Poor. It, it must uh, have been because they kept switching the gimmick on and they couldn't commit to a gimmick. That must have been it. It's got to be. You can only be you can only be switched around so many times. All right, but then we have the new generation and that kind of leads into the attitude era and in the middle of kind of this time frame, assuming I have my dates essentially correct, we get the va- the very famous Montreal screw job out of which comes one of the most successful wrestling heels of all time in the form of the Mr. McMahon character. Now, I bring him up in part because I'm watching The Simpsons Unending Marathon, and I just saw Mr. Burns wheeled into a courtroom to pay out a fine, and I couldn't help but think of Vince McMahon when I see Mr. Burns. Now, granted, Burns is old and feeble, but they're both old, they have the gray hair thing going on, and they're superior, wealthy kind of people you wish to see hurt. So, Mr. McMahon is a character. I, cause, I mean, unless you have been holding out on the entire world and know him personally, and this is the only way I'm going to speak to it. He, this is one of the craziest things in wrestling history because you lost Bret Hart, who was your top – he was the top guy in the company. And yes, you had the rivalry between him and Sean was kind of carrying things. The Undertaker was kind of in the third fiddle position behind those two. You lose the top guy. And Austin was coming on as well at that point in time, but – you lose the top guy in your company to your competitor, and Vince McMahon decides he's going to take this opportunity to create, again, one of the most successful villainous personas that has ever been portrayed on wrestling television, especially when you consider the longevity of the character. Yeah, it got a little tired towards the end, but by the same token, that was a good 10-year run that essentially the same character had on television as at any given point in time, the most hated guy in the company. So I'm just, I, I want kind of your thoughts on, you know, the evil billionaire owner of the promotion character that, that, that he was able to kind of craft for himself. Well, let, let's go back here and, and kind of talk about how that all came to be. Um, I mean, you, Are we going to listen to Vince Russo's little... rendition of history here? <laughs> no, no. He was um, on the phone for all of those. Come on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, look, at, at the end of the day, uh, the WWE knew that it had to make a change in, and they wanted to go in a direction that some of the wrestlers just weren't comfortable going in. They weren't really comfortable going in, in a more adult oriented um, direction. And some were all for it. And, you know, Brett was one of those guys that just it, it has historically said he wasn't comfortable with where they were going. And I think, Forgetting about all the various stories of how the Montreal screw job came to be, I think at the end of the day Vince McMahon just said, Look, if you're if you're if you're not with us, you're against us. And if you're not willing to do everything possible to make this company succeed and remember, it wasn't that long ago. It was like nineteen ninety six, I think, you know, or, or on ninety five, ninety six where they had such a bad year they couldn't make payroll at times. So um, you know, they they've got they're they're just coming out of the Federal, uh, federal law. Um, well, the steroid investigation again. was around then, right? Yeah, Ninety-three through ninety-six were not good years for the WWE. They, um, Mr. McMahon may have very well gone to federal prison. Um, there were uh, the, the entire talent roster was turned over. Um, so by so ninety-six, ninety-seven, ninety-eight. They're at, the, at that point. They're just picking up the pieces and trying to get the, the ship. And as they're doing this. Ted Turner um, gives uh, WCW two hours on Monday nights to go right up against Raw. You have to think about where Vince McMahon is in, in, is in his state of mind at that point, where he's basically like, uh, we've got to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks, because if we don't, we may very well lose this company. And some of the wrestlers just weren't on board. One of those was Bret Hart. And um, if you listen to Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels talk about um, the, in their greatest rivalries video about the Montreal screw job, basically it goes like this. Sean uh, Brett 
told Sean at some point in, the, in their feud that backstage that, you know, he didn't mind putting him over and he, and uh, he was happy for Sean and that he respected him. And Sean turned around and said, well, I'm glad you respect me because I'll never put you over. And Brett basically took it to heart and said, just forget it then. I'm not, you know, I have no use for you. Um, and so when it came time to, for, the, for the Survivor Series, you know, you've got Vince McMahon saying, we got to go in this other direction here and we got to throw Brett off the boat. Basically Um, you have Brett Hart, not willing to put over Shawn Michaels because Shawn Michaels was a douchebag and Shawn and Shawn Michaels is kind of in the middle of all of this. Um, And in a, you know, in a month or two, he'll break his back. So that's Shawn's story right there. Um, But you know, they went ahead with the Montreal screw job and in, 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 in the process they really just went with what was a very obvious thing. Without knowing all the inside dope, people saw the Montreal screw job and immediately saw it from Bret Hart's point of view and thought Vince McMahon and the WWE uh was just a big butt bag of shit. And that's how they got treated and Vince McMahon just got a rolled with it. But the other side of that was with Sean gone after he breaks his back in January and then drops the title to Steve Austin at WrestleMania um, uh, two months later, there's no top heel in the company. Um, Yokozuna is gone, I think, by this point. Bret Hart's gone. Shawn Michaels is gone. The Undertaker, uh, I think at this point, was still a baby face and was really not ready for that like that top heel position just yet. And he had not nobody... yet transitioned into the Minister of Darkness. Right. There's nobody at the top of the company. They they lost their entire like heel roster, uh, main event heel roster in one foul swoop in like a three month period. So there's this gaping hole there, um, and in walks Vince McMahon to fill that hole to be the heel against Austin, and the story just sort of took on a life of its own. It's funny. Steve Austin uh, was talking about uh, on this on, on this podcast about sometimes the Austin versus McMahon thing was pure storyline. Sometimes it was a shoot. You Wait, know. Steve Austin talking on his podcast? No. Yeah, I know. Uh, hang on. <laughs> swig, a, swig, swig a beer for the working man. <laughs> I actually did enjoy his interviews with uh, the two party he has up with Mick Foley right now. Partially because he lets yeah. Foley talk a little bit. Yes, instead of cutting him off. Um, it's the worst interviewer ever. Well, let me get back case, to that you asked me a second. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, asked me, you asked me about Vince McMahon. Um, and just kind of finish up there. Uh, by putting Vince McMahon as your top heel, but really making him more of a, of a of a manager. I mean, Vince McMahon essentially became Bobby the Brain Heenan. He was there to get heat for guys that weren't quite quite ready to be carrying the feud all by themselves. And he was very physical, obviously. He took a lot of beatings in that ring. Um, but it, like I said, it gave an opportunity to Mick Foley, who was a solid hand and could get over and could handle himself as a heel – but really wasn't a, a main event player at that point. He kind of becomes Vince McMahon's hand there for a little while, and then they build towards the Undertaker becoming the you know um, the uh, the heel, and and then turning into the uh, going in that Ministry of Darkness uh, direction towards the end of the year. This also gives them uh, time to start building up guys like The Rock, who who would become Austin's major uh, heel foe. Through uh, through that period, but to go back, um, you asked me about Vince McMahon, and you know, I just, I, I, I really, I think I just summed it up. He was Bobby the Brain Heenan for the, for the the Attitude Era. You know, he got heat for Mick Foley, he got heat for Kane, um, more so I think than Paul Bearer. He I'd agree with that. He created an atmosphere where they where Austin had plenty of opposition and plenty of hurdles to jump over to continue to make him a strong baby face. Um, you know, it's funny. I've often criticized Vince McMahon for feeling like I don't think he really wants to run a wrestling company, but I don't know of a better guy who, un- I don't know of a guy who better understands the, um, the, re- the, the, the errors of wrestling that led to the attitude era. I don't think he gets it anymore. <laughs> I don't think, underst- I don't think Vince McMahon is useful uh, and behind the scenes of, in the WWE these days in 2014. But up to that point, the man had been engrossed in the industry. He knew how to get over. He knew how to get others over. And he knew how to play 
the kind of heel that um, that sells tickets. And he's probably the best heel manager, uh, the best heel character in modern wrestling history. I mean, the sad thing is there's not a whole lot of competition for him in that area. And part of that is the nature of kind of the constant turns we got during the Attitude Era. Part of that is people, I guess, just don't feel like being heels that sell tickets anymore, which is a whole other discussion that we can get into <laughs> kind of when I wrap this up because I have some serious thoughts on the state of being a villain in contemporary wrestling. And uh, I will, again, we'll get to that after we get uh, done with the anthology-style kind of methodology I've laid out for this show. But Vince McMahon, I thought one of the greatest additions to his character was the Stooges in the form of Pat Patterson and Jerry Briscoe. You had two guys who were incredibly talented workers uh, when they were actually in the ring. Now backstage... Now they're in backstage roles, and you. But you just had Vince McMahon, and you had these two guys who were out there sucking up to everything he did. It was like you had two versions of Smithers, and one of them was straight. <laughs> See, it's funny because Smithers is gay, and so is Pat Patterson. <laughs> but I mean, you had, well, it was great because you also had another. You had an insulation layer between Austin, for example, or uh, man, or mankind once. Austin, uh, once they made that switch to Rock being the corporate champion and uh, Mankind chasing the belt a little bit there. But you had these, uh, this extra layer of insulation between your hero and your villain, someone who could take the cutoff, take a beating, give your villain a chance to escape unharmed and increase the amount of anticipation and heat for the whole thing. So, and, uh, and he made them do – I mean, those two guys, did they were involved in some of the worst stuff on television. I mean – not all of it was there. They were involved in some good stuff, too. I mean, the match, but the uh, I think it's like a hardcore Falls Count Anywhere, no DQ style match that Austin has with Dude Love at, I cannot remember the pay-per-view. Might have been one of the over-the-edge ones. You, I, you're probably going to jump in here and correct me because I can't remember, but... No, it was, it was over the edge. It was over the edge. Okay, thank you. And... The, I mean, if you haven't seen the match, everybody, kind of the whole thing is Vince McMahon is going to be the special guest referee. So he appoints a special guest timekeeper in the form of Jerry Briscoe, a special ring announcer in the form of Pat Patterson. And he then dares anyone in the locker room to come out there and make sure he plays by the rules, which naturally leads to The Undertaker coming out and staring him down the entire time, which is kind of great. But Pat Patterson out there with his long-winded, long-winded, gloriously over-the-top introductions for... Because he introduces... He's brought out first, and he has a great introduction by Howard Finkel, who looks just disgusted and he has to read off all of these things that... These accomplishments and ridiculous statements about Patterson. Patterson then introduces Briscoe as the ring announce, as the uh, timekeeper. McMahon as the referee, and Dude Love as the challenger, and then he refuses to introduce Austin. I mean, it, it's great, but they were also involved in just... Didn't they have, like, a match where they were both in evening gowns? I mean, just awful, awful stuff? Yeah, I mean, it started out, you know, establishing the McMahon uh, character, um, he had henchmen, and those were his henchmen. You know, that's where they got the name the Stooges from, because basically they were were just like bump machines for Austin. You know, it would go out there. They were were essentially like um, if this were... Uh, the old Batman 66 show, they were um, henchmen one and two. <laughs> um, you know, and that's it. They were, they were just out there for, you know, to, to bump for Austin and, uh, you know, and, and take beatings um, because Vince McMahon didn't have an army yet. You know, later on, he'll build up the corporation and he'll catch Shamrock and um, the big boss year man. From- the, yeah, the big boss man, and he'll have the big show. Um, you know, the, and, and, and they'll, they become less dependent on the Stooges, um, other than Vince McMahon's you know, propensity for humiliating people that are loyal to him for some odd reason. Um, but in the beginning, he didn't have that army. You know, it's really funny because when you think about like the early that that transition from the end of the new generation into the Attitude Era, which if you mark the depending on your definition of things. It could either be the Montreal screw job is sort of the dividing line. It could be when Austin won the title at WrestleMania 14, because that's really the because that's the, that'll be the last time you see Shawn Michaels in any significant role until he comes back to fight Triple H at SummerSlam a couple of years later. Um, and Shawn Michaels was, I think, like really one of the, the last of the red hot 
uh, new generation guys outside of the Undertaker. Um, so, if, so I mean, that's that's kind of the starting point that I like to use is Austin winning the title at WrestleMania 14, and that kind of kicks things off. Um, but when you think about that, they really were in the midst of just rebuilding the entire roster. Um, so as I said before, not only were there not, they're not, there weren't any major heel main eventers, but the fact that, that Vince McMahon had to depend on two old agents <laughs> to be his henchmen, and it tells you they didn't have a particularly thick roster to begin with. I want to ask you one question before we move on. I watched something, it might have been the Austin DVD, uh, which streams on Netflix, incidentally enough, which is where I saw it. But he's hitting the stunners on, you know, everybody. Do you, is it just me, or is it odd that uh, Briscoe, when he takes the stunner, does a front flip? <laughs> there were, have, you, there were have you noticed with, this? I mean, Patterson there, takes it pretty was, straight. Vince takes it horribly from time to time. But Dude, Vince, Briscoe Vince is the takes the stunner and then does stunners. a somersault. Yeah, it was just one of those weird bump things that happens. Um, you know, Vince McMahon, I think the ver- when he took the stunner in Madison Square Garden, he didn't, like, he sold, but he sold in a very weird way. He just basically collapsed. Like, instead of, <laughs> instead of like, taking an actual bump, he just falls, you know? Yeah. Um, and he doesn't even have the abrupt motion off- that um, Bret Hart did when he took the stunner. No, he, he acted like he had, like was having a seizure. I was yeah. alive for that, I remember vividly. But um, it was just weird. Bert, like uh, I, I, I praise Vince McMahon for, you know, for being this guy who really understood character and motivation and how to um, play with an audience's uh, emotion, um, and you know, and get and get, uh, you know, and get a character over. Physically, it's as if he's never been in a wrestling ring before. And I understand he was an announcer and an owner and everything else, but I'm sorry. Uh, the, except from the the one or t- the, the the few months that I was in XPW, my exposure to wrestling has been pretty much through the TV, and I could bump better than him. Like I don't understand how you could be around wrestling for decades and fucking bump so badly, even at his. So, age. here's a question then: Who took it worse, their first ever stunner, Vince McMahon or Donald Trump? Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> God. You're asking me to pitch which dead body looks more decrepit. Um, you know, the one that sticks out to me is is Vince McMahon, so I'm going to go with that one. So um, all right, I just I just barely remember the the Trump one. The Vince McMahon one is forever etched into my mind. I have to bring up the Donald's hair every now and then, just for the sake of sure. it. Sure. All right, you mentioned uh, the other kind of interesting dynamic I want to get into before. I want to make sure we get to, rather. Um, Bret Hart, following WrestleMania 13, was in this weird position where he was vehemently hated in America and loved everywhere else. And that's not just Canada that liked him. If you listen, uh, some of the reports that have come out, and I, I won't give credence to some of the more outlandish ones, but... He was a big face in Germany. He was a big face in England. Anywhere internationally they went, Bret Hart was the good guy. He was still the hero. In America, everyone wishes to set him on fire. What, I mean, and by the same token, he's kind of feuding with Shawn Michaels at the time. Uh, This is leading into the Montreal Screwjob in particular. And you have Shawn Michaels, who is now being cheered in America, in part for his ridiculous juvenile antics and because we hate Bret Hart. Everywhere else in the world, people look at him and go, no, no, we don't like you. You know, no, we don't like you anymore. Go away. They wish to set Sean on fire or stick a bunch of Marines on him. Either way works. <laughs> um, why, why was he hated in the United States? Well, I think you, you, you said it. You know, Sean acted juvenile and this country truly appreciates I mean, look at some of the comedies that are out there. It's all men behaving badly, you know. Well, we are long since the days of uh, of interesting humor like Mel Brooks. It's all you know. It's all guys taking shits on other people's lawns, um, you know, and uh, Will Ferrell running naked across the street. Uh, None of and which so that was funny. appealing. Well, it was appealing to people in America, and you know, and Sean definitely played to that. That was one. Of, that was the thing that made G Generation X popular. Was they acted like complete. Over-sexualized assholes, and 
this country is made up of over-sexualized assholes. It was a perfect fit. Um, I think that as far as other nations go, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> I'm go off topic, but there's a lot of anti-American sentiment out there. Um, you know, nobody, everybody hates the number one. Um, and for, in for a good long while there, you know, the United States was, uh, well ahead economically, uh, you know, in a lot of areas. So, I mean, um, I think, you know, I think in, on a very generalized level, there's, re, there's resentment towards the United States, which, which played out in, you know, in people favoring Bret Hart. I think another thing about it was, um, in, like I said, in America, we tend to fancy the the outlaw, the anti-hero, you know, the cool bad guy. Um, the rest of the world seems to still dig traditional heroes, and that kind of Bret, that was Bret Hart's thing. He never stopped being Bret Hart. He was still a traditional hero. Um, the difference was he was being rejected. Him being a traditional hero was being rejected in America. For you know what would be the NWO and DX and Steve Austin and uh, the rest of the world didn't. Um, I mean, people liked Austin. Don't get me wrong, but I think people around the world still dug traditional heroes, which he continued to act like. But if you look at if you listen to really what the content of Bret Hart's um, promos were, it was you. I never. I didn't leave you, uh, America. You left me. I'm still me. I'm still Bret Hart. Uh, I'm still doing my thing. And I haven't changed. You've all changed, and you like, you know, complete bags of shit like Shawn Michaels. And then, you know, Amer- and then American fans would be even more incensed because how dare you criticize us? We have every right to like bags of shit like Shawn Michaels. So it just kind of went on from there. How dare you point out remarks that we resemble? How dare <laughs> you, sir? Well, it was, a, it was just a, a really interesting dynamic, and I mean, nowadays you still get kind of the hometown or home country pop. I mean, William Regal. For a, when he kind of towards the tail end of his career a little bit, but there was a stretch of time when he was vehemently disliked in the United States. But any time you went to England, he was the conquering hero, and everybody loved him. You still get elements of that, but by the same token, Regal was still a bad guy everywhere that wasn't like his hometown type of scenario. Do you think we're going to wind up seeing something kind of along that? Uh, scale in the near future where you have a guy who is in one particular lo- who is in one location just vehemently hated and then thought of very differently uh you know elsewhere in the world yeah. i mean we had Ryback get the big uh you know kind of the face pops coming out uh, off of uh this Monday night actually because they were in Vegas and that's where he's from well, well hang on but, i can name two guys that are loved okay. in their home countries but hated in the united states and and Please booed say great pretty used to no, uh, Anderson Silva and George St. Pierre. <laughs> you know I'm right. Man, I do. Boo I Anderson don't... Silva here in America. They fucking hate him for you know dancing a jig and being an arrogant prick. Uh, and, he, and he goes to Brazil, and people are like, "Yes, more of that, please." George St. Pierre. He gets booed out of buildings because he's you know boring as shit, you know, and he just lays on people. Right? That's what they say. But uh, in Canada, they're just like, yes, more snuggling. We love it. Hey, you know, I'll say this for George. At least he had a consistent title defense schedule, unlike, say, Johnny Hendricks. Yeah, well, but, but let's not get off uh, on a complete tangent. <laughs> no, no, but you know, know what I mean. I do. I, have, but, I no, do. And... It, it doesn't lend some credence to uh, what's his face, you know, um, Jim Cornette's uh, thing about uh, the you know, mixed martial arts as, as the new pro wrestling. Um, because you do see a lot of that. You know, you see people who are uh, loved in their hometowns and no one gives a shit about them anywhere else, <laughs> you know, and they're using a lot of the old traditional uh, storytelling motifs to try to get their guys over, um, while wrestling kind of tends to overthink things. Oh, there's truth to that. I mean, a few years ago when the UFC started expanding, what did we get every time they went to Brazil or England? You had the happy, go, you know, the plucky, fiery local baby face and the evil foreign heel. Yep. Uh, granted, that's I mean, Michael the whole hard top to bottom. Hang on, Michael Bisping is a great example of this. Michael Bisping loved in England. Every time they tour uh, England, even if they, wherever they go in Europe, Michael Bisping is the plucky baby face. He's a bag of shit, and everyone knows it. And he's booed out of the building in America. Oh, uh, boy, isn't that true? But in the world of wrestling, do you think we've? Uh, I mean, 
we're going to kind of set aside John Cena, who has divided everyone pretty consistently along age and gender lines. <laughs> um, it's hard I mean, because I don't think I don't think people get over organically anymore, and when they do, you know, it, it's an it's an uphill slog. I mean, look at what happened with Brian um, with Brian Daniels. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, Daniel Bryan. Uh, he just, you know, he did get over organically. No matter what they threw at him, he uh, he turned it into money, and it, it took CM Punk quitting for him to get his rightfully earned main event WrestleMania shot, and then he fucking broke his neck on purpose, just just to spite the WWE. That's the story. Um, so, oh yeah, I broke know. his I mean, neck. Now he needs Tommy John surgery as well, apparently. So I just. I, I, I think it's very hard now for guys to get over organically. Um, it, there's also the, the, the business is just way overexposed. There's too much WWE content, like modern content. You know, I don't mind stuff like the network, but there's, there's this there's too much WWE right now, um, and so it, people guys have a hard time getting over. You know, they they start out as kind of maybe like flash in the pan or their their novelties. But as far you know, but the kind of longevity that guys like The Rock and Steve Austin were able to uh, create, I don't think you see a lot of that anymore. Um, certainly, to, to your question of you know, do you think we'll ever see a guy get over in one part of the world, but um, as a face, but as a you know, but as a heel in another part? Um, I don't know. I I think it's just hard enough getting over. Period. Let alone being the kind of Bret Hart figure that you're talking about. That's a fair point. All right. Since we kind of brought up the Montreal screws up, I'm I want to ask you about uh, the Rock when he went corporate. Mm-hmm. That was uh, well. First of all, as Rocky Maivia, he just kind of flopped. I mean, it, it was like a serious version of Bo Dallas type of scenario for anyone who watches the current product. And it wasn't working. He got he was supposed to be the you know the blue chip plucky white meat baby face, and people were chanting "Die Rocky, Die" at him. So he joins right. the Nation of Domination. That, after that breaks apart, he just kind of – he starts getting over. People are gravitating towards The Rock, and then they yank the rug out from under your feet at Survivor Series. I forget the year. He becomes Deadly the corporate game. champion. Yeah. So it was 1999, by the way. Oh, yeah, thank you. Now, that's that's kind of an odd thing in that everyone wanted to cheer for The Rock at that point because he's The Rock. I mean, he wasn't quite to the same stature he would achieve in the next couple of years, but he was still – immensely entertaining and he had great fire and everyone wanted to cheer for him and it worked so well when they yanked the rug out from under you and he turned on everybody and it One makes second. sense it was, it, was 1990, it was 1998 i apologize 98 now I'm, okay. I'm good go ahead but they yanked the rug out from everybody and it made sense for the rock to turn on the people because again they had turned on him earlier and he's like well you want me to die go ahead and get bent i'll get paid my, I suppose my question becomes, is, did we just get to a point where that became a bit too overused, where we have the baby face that people want to get behind and, well, we'll turn him heel? I mean, I suppose one of the bigger, one of the, you know, an example of that that didn't work out so well would be Austin at WrestleMania 17 turning and joining with Vince McMahon. Same kind of thing. Everybody wants to cheer for Austin still. So why, you know, so the turn seemed, and everyone in hindsight has kind of said, and it was a little ill-advised in terms of execution and whatnot. But The Rock as corporate heel, he's also kind of set the standard for a lot of modern wrestling villains. I mean, whether it's as the corporate guy, which has been kind of aped, or as Hollywood Rock, which Miz is now doing a C version knockoff of, give or take. So I, I suppose just about The Rock as a heel, when he started that really I – mean, he became the corporate champion, dissed the people, and just kind of embraced being the superior, entitled douchebag that everyone – that he could be and made everyone hate him so much. Well, again, much like McMahon, there's a whole backstory here. So he comes in, and he's immediately rejected by all the fans, and he's done nothing wrong. And while – you know, well, wrestling is a work. These are still people, and they have feelings. You know, and and and, and, and he tried. God damn it! It's you know, it's like yes, he was benefiting on his name and you know his father and his grandfather, and maybe another guy who looks like The Rock doesn't have nearly the opportunities that that guy did in the WWE. And people, I don't know, uh, Roman uh, Reigns uh, seems to be getting all kinds of opportunities. He's also, I think, like related to The Rock and Samoan, but that's neither here nor there. Cousin, um, I think. 
Yeah. Um, the point I'm getting to is, I you know I think um, Dwayne Johnson sort of sits up and he says, you know, these people they're they're essentially taking their frustrations out on me that I'm benefiting on my family's name, and how is that fair to me? I'm still the one doing the work. I'm the one taking the bumps. You know, sometimes the father's in here taking them for me. Um, so kind of fuck these. And that became his character and his motivation, um, which was great. And it, it was why it worked, because it came from a very real place. You know, if you if you really feel like, you know what, fuck the fans, that's going to come out. But it isn't kind of fuck the fans, I don't want to do this anymore. It's fuck the fans, I'm going to show you how good I really am. Never mind my father and my grandfather and this and that, whatever other excuses you're making. I'm just that damn good. And that's what he became. Um and you know, and eventually, because he started to cut loose and let more of his personality out, he won fans over. But he started, but you know, but but it started from a very dark place of screw you people. So now, fast forward to 1998, November, uh, and they and they redo the Montreal screw job for the first of a million times. Oy. And you know, and he said it even the next night. He was like, "I haven't forgotten how you fuckers treated me." No, 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 no. I have. You know, it's funny to hear him now because now it's like, The Rock is the people's champion. The Rock came back for the people. The Rock used to hate the people. Okay? Let's be serious here. You know, that whole character came from a place of, I'll never forgive you for telling me to die. So, and meaning and, and, it. But that's, and that's why it there, there were people who meant it. it. You know, it was a, a very similar thing to Mick Foley and, you know, and Cactus Jack and Mankind. You know, when there's a guy in this, when there's a guy with a sign in Philadelphia that says Kane Dewey, and Mick Foley's like, "What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> really? Is that where we're at? Okay, you know." Um, and a lot of his promos in ECW came out of a real resentment of the fans for for being that way. So I think that's when the best, you know, it's been said time and time again. Um, the characters work out best when they come from a place that is very, very real. Um, you know, and that's why the that's why the Rock worked. You know, as far as pulling the rug out from everybody, again, it was, he was made a much stronger character by going back to no, 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 no. I still hate you all. <laughs> no. Well, it was a, by this. That's also a note that he hit again years later when uh, he turned on Hogan. They had mm-hmm. the rematch. I forget what event it was at, but there was after WrestleMania 18. There was the rematch between The Rock and Hogan, and he was le- and that was the birth of Hollywood Rock. But he came out the next night, and there were some people cheering him and some people cheering for Hogan. And he goes, "No, no, 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 you can't do that," because then it sounds like Rogan, Rogaine, which Hogan could use by the way. And no, it, it comes out all muddled. No, no, no. You're either going to cheer The Rock or you're going to boo The Rock, and you've lost the right to sing along with my catchphrases. And he just, I mean, it it was brilliant. I mean, Hollywood Rock was one of my favorite personas that he ever adopted because he was just so, I mean, again, it comes from a place of reality in the sense that a degree of that he felt and a degree of that was the fans. But it was so much fun to watch him be that superior in part because he used it to help. I mean, if I could just get off topic for a second, the Rock put over the hurricane, people. Think about that for just a second. And he didn't have to do that. He did that because he liked Shane Helms and thought they could have some great stuff together. And they did. I mean, those two interact. I, I almost want to see them do kind of like a buddy comedy movie, just because their interplay <laughs> could be that much fun. Agreed. All right. Uh, is there anyone else I really wanted to? There are a few other people I want to get. To. Okay. Uh, since we're kind of moving toward the Attitude Era, I want to talk about The Undertaker, because he spent a long time as a face, as just kind of the big omnipresent, dragon-slaying, ass-kicking machine. Then he goes dark. And his character as the leader of the Ministry of Darkness, the evolution of The Undertaker as a character is actually a really interesting study because he changes from... He changes enough to remain relevant. And during the Attitude Era, he didn't go with... He was no longer the reanimated corpse that he'd been in the beginning. He wasn't just, again, kind of the unstoppable supernatural phenom... Now he's leading a cult of vampires and naked Midian and the Acolytes, and it's a very different 
feel for him. He goes and he's talking about sacrificing people. He tries to force Stephanie McMahon to marry him, which, since we're using wrestling logic, you have to remember a little bit, much like Disney. You see, in the world of Disney, forcing someone to marry you is the adult equivalent of rape, and that's kind of the same thing we've got going on here. So The Undertaker as the Minister of Darkness... And he, again, some alterations to the costume, the presentation, the entrance music. How was that for you? How was him going from, you know, where he had been to now just satanic? I love the Ministry of Darkness. I loved all of the Ministry of Darkness. Well, we all know you love Naked Midian. Of course, because Naked, <laughs> Naked Midian was awesome. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, look, he needed a refreshing... And again, the uh, the Attitude Era could have also been called the era of um, gritty realism in wrestling. Um, yeah, it was over the top and everything, but it was. A, remember, they were try- they were trying to get away from the Saturday morning cartoon rock and wrestling. Um, you know, uh, everyone has a second job uh, type of uh, type of wrestling that nearly bankrupted the WWE towards its, towards its end. Um, and so, what do you do with a zombie? Okay, you know you don't want the zombie's still popular, but you really can't get away with doing the zombie thing in a, in an era where you know your champion is a beer drinking hillbilly who runs around the locker room stunning people. Um, in the it, locker it, it, it room, doesn't make any. Not, that, that's not a hostile work environment or anything. <laughs> it doesn't really make a, t- a tremendous amount of sense. So um, so instead, you make him a satanic cult leader, and he's awesome. He. he Mark Calloway, everything they threw at him, he turned into gold. It was great, you know. Um, and, and then giving him an entire stable of wrestlers, you know, to, to, to bump for him and build, you know, and build him up towards uh, a couple of more main events. It was, it was great fun. Uh, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the Black Wedding. I enjoyed uh, – I loved their theme music. I wish he'd uploaded it tonight. The, the Ministry of Darkness Undertaker theme music is the best he's ever had. With the possible exception of uh, Limp Biscuit. <clears throat> Sorry. Keep rolling. Rolling, 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 rolling. Yeah. I always liked his big evil music. Meh. Or what was the variation on that? After he got drafted to SmackDown and became a good guy over there, and he altered it just a little bit. I enjoyed that version as well. But yeah, when you consider the volume of changes his character has gone through, the fact that he never really suffered for it. I mean, again, anything. He turned it into something that worked. All right. Um, since I've been – it's been brought up on Facebook a few times, I feel compelled now to bring up the big boss man just a little bit, specifically because apparently Pat Mullen and Jesse Starcher, who are playing the home game, want me to bring up the uh, feud between the big show and the big boss man. Oh, uh, you can't bring up the big show, big boss man feud without the Benny Hill casket scene. Then there's the big show riding the casket. Oh, God. So bad. This is poorly designed and executed. Big show wins the title, and his first major feud is with the boss man. He couldn't have come up with something better. Somebody had. Well, again, remember what was going on at that time. Still. Everybody, you know, I think, you know, they. Essentially, he was just holding on to the title. Oh fuck! I guess that was what 1999. Yeah, that he was holding on to the title uh, long enough for uh, it to go on uh, Triple H and then be contested at WrestleMania. I mean, you know, I I forget how he loses the title, but it, but Triple H ends up. I want to say, uh, maybe I got my years wrong, but I feel like going into like the Big Show was. Oh, you know, I'm gonna have to look it up. So I. Go ahead and look. I'm just looking at Homer's wonderful, glorious giant sandwich that is going to make him violently ill in a few moments, but it's still hilarious. That was at uh, it was at Rock Bottom. It was a, it was a February. It was a December pay per view. Um, big Show. Let me just look it up. Big Show. Okay. Big Show versus Big Boss Man. Well, that led to the battle from it was hell. So one of the greatest matches of all time. Oh, gee. Uh, yeah, if you're into the Mystery Science Theater 3000 type scenario. Okay, yeah, Big Boss Man versus The Big Show was Armageddon 1999, which would then lead into the the four-way in 2000. Oh, that. And the, you know, worse than the match between Show and Boss Man was the commentary, having to talk about the dogs. 
<laughs> well, back back to uh, Big Boss Man, um, just in general. Uh, he was another one that got a career resurgence and a gimmick makeover. He was he, he was the head of security for the corporation because again they weren't doing the whole um, you know everyone's got a second job bit. You know he couldn't be the uh, the evil the evil prison guard, guard or cop. cop. <laughs> Yeah, he you know he had they had to figure out something for him to do, so they gave him um, the they gave him the tack gear, and they said, okay, you're head of security for uh, the corporation, protect McMahon at all costs. Uh, he was a hired gun, he was a mercenary, and it worked. Um, I thought it, I thought it was some sort of Big Boss Man's best work, you know. It was <laughs> not since him and the Mountie had a feud, which ended with the Mountie having to go to jail as the Boss Man. Seemed oh no. To- you had to go to jail for a night. Didn't like explicitly say it was just one night. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> I wasn't paying that close attention. Yeah, and anyone who was felt stupid. <laughs> but um, the, I mean, I, I feel like anyone that you ask me, I'm gonna say I liked. I, there was a lot to like about that era. Um, you know, I I I just feel like there were a lot of fun characters. Not everybody had to be, you know, the top of the card. But guys played their roles and they played them well, and you know, and I felt like they belonged. All right, the last one I want to ask you specifically about before we close up shop and just do plugs and whatnot. <sighs> this character, I uh, I want to talk to you about Goldust for just a second or two. Sure. Because as a as a character, Goldust being the you know effeminate kind of I mean, again the character was supposed to be gay, but you couldn't go out and but I mean it was an odd thing where. Had they actually made the character out to be gay, it probably wouldn't have been well-received. It was this odd kind of social climate where the fact that he was just kind of challenging your sexuality in general or the fact that he might prefer men, which, I mean, apparently that just deeply offended all of the pubescent teenage males that were big into the product at the time. I wonder why. But he just... He was such a great character, and he had some he had some pretty legitimate heat from what I remember. People were not pleased that he's out there doing these things that make them feel so uncomfortable. And then, you know, between some backlash and a few other things, we wind up kind of neutering the character a little bit. Didn't, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Goldus, wasn't Goldus retired for a bit? Dustin Rhodes uh, came in, had kind of a preacher, born-again type of gimmick going on for a while. He, he, might have, uh, he might have. I don't remember it. I, I have vague memories associated with that. But so Goldust as you know the kind of the overtly homosexual cross-dressing guy who just makes you your skin crawl a little bit and makes you want to cross to the other side of the street. Um, I'm trying to think back because like I feel like um I feel like I, I I liked and appreciated the character, but I don't like like sitting you know now at 38 years old you know in my, and thinking back on it, I'm like, yeah, Goldust was a great character. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't think I actually felt like that at the time. I think at the time I was annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, and not, not, I, and I think because I knew what they were trying to do, and I was just like, oh God, why? Why do we have to have a gay character? And that's kind of his gimmick is that he's gay. When they started doing a lot of stuff with the movies, and he was more just trying to mess with people's heads, um, I got into it. I think um, I'm remembering I had a real visceral reaction um, because he feuded with The Undertaker in the beginning. Uh, or when I, when I was watching him, he was feuding with The Undertaker at one point. But he was doing the cowardly heel thing where um, I remember they, like, they had a casket match. And I think like Mankind came out of the casket and said to save gold dust. But it was one of those things where he, I didn't feel like he was tough. I think, I think that was my problem. I just felt like he wasn't a particularly tough wrestler. Um, they were doing, they, they made him into like a cowardly heel. And I'm like, that's gay. Yeah. <laughs> that's gay. In a, that's gay in a bad way. Um, you're using it as you know, a pejorative. I, yeah. I, uh, I think I preferred my bad guy. You know, people like Chris was making fun of me last night on a, a soon to be released, <laughs> uh, WrestleCast. You know, we'll, we'll get you to it eventually. That. I assume they just never get released. Um, but you know, he was just like, I bet if Brock Lesnar walks in the room and demands a blowjob, you give it to him. And, like, it's not even, like, about that. It's that Brock Lesnar just comes, like, his character comes across as, like, a super tough guy. I hate when they make him cowardly. It doesn't seem to fit into his character. 
you know, I like the fact that he says things like, I am an ass kicking machine. Okay, you're not. You got kicked in the you got kicked in the belly by Alistair Overeem and ran out of the ring like a baby. But you know, let's be fair. The, the, if Alistair Overeem on steroids, like he was, kicked you in the belly, you might die. Brock didn't die. <laughs> and that goes for me too. Just as a legal disclaimer, Alistair Overeem kicking me in the gut would incapacitate me for a good thirty minutes. Fair enough. But his character, you know, is colossus. And I love the fact that, you know, that he rarely backs down and he's just an ass-kicking machine where they made Goldust like, – because I think Goldust started off a lot more aggressively, and I was okay with that. When they turned him into Ric Flair, I was like, ugh, I'm done with this. Eh, fair point. Although – and to further be fair, Ric Flair made a lot of money being a coward. That doesn't mean I have to like it. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but – and – also, in the interest of full disclosure, Flair spent a lot more than he made. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Yes, he did. I mean, hey, he could have bought a second house. Instead, he wanted to shoot. Yeah, Ric Flair's terrible with money. Uh, all right. Uh, there anyone else from this, from that kind of era as a villain that you feel like you want to talk about that we may have overlooked? That, I mean, again, there's a lot of good stuff there. There's some pretty awful, like the matches in many cases. I don't have the rose-colored glasses for this time frame, so I look back. I mean, as an example, when Daniel Bryan and Kane had their uh, title match at Backlash or whatever the heck they're calling it nowadays, I think it's Extreme Rules, and they did the brawling into the back and all that odd stuff, I remember it's like, you know, they did this every week during the Attitude Era, and it wasn't any good then either. <laughs> but um, any, I, I, mean, I don't mean, no, because not I, all of them were bad. I'll, I'll go ahead and say that. No. Off, off the top of my head, I don't really remember anybody that I'm just like, oh, I can't believe we didn't mention them. We we didn't mention a lot, but that's because we're trying to keep the show to an hour. I mean, we could come back and do, like, part two of this and talk about, like, Right to Censor and um, and some of the other groups. Oh, but, you know, I think uh, I, I think I'm good for the night. All right, yeah, we might have to revisit this just for some of the because I completely forgot about the right to censor and how much people hated them. In some cases, with good reason. That, that was some of the best work of uh, Stevie Richards. Yes, yes, it was. All right, but that is going to wrap us up in our brief discussion tonight of wrestling villains from the Attitude Era. Some good ones, some not so good ones. Kennel from Hell. Hey, what if the dog gives birth in the cage? We could have two, three generations of these things in the cell. That was a line from commentary. People, that's not me freelance or freestyling. That was actually said. All right. So, Mark, what do you got to plug? I got a network. Go listen to it. No, um, that's, <laughs> that's my new thing now. <laughs> I'm, the I'm WWE, but you're cheaper. Yes, exactly. Um, no, uh, Robert uh, has two show, has two shows on the network, um, which I'm sure he can he you know he can plug himself. Uh, Tuesdays is the Whiskey Rebellion with myself, Gavin Napier, and Chris Evans. Uh, we talk about news today. Um, this past week, we talked about uh, Rush Limbaugh's reaction to Robin Williams. We talked about the Ferguson, Missouri uh, issue going on right now. We, we talked about The Rock um, in the next, you know, one of the DC movies coming out. Um, and we did a little conspiracy talk. So that's Tuesday nights at 9:30. Um, Thursday night, Rob Cooper was a little late to the party, so Jesse Starcher stepped into the breach, and we reviewed the new Judas Priest album. Um, in two weeks from Thursday, we'll be reviewing the new Baby Metal from February of this past year, but uh, it's still awesome. And uh, I, when I realized that they actually had an album, I'm like, no, I don't care when this was released. We have to, we have to listen to it. Um, Absolutely. This, uh, Robert and I have a review of The Expendables up. Uh, next week, we'll have a wrap-up of all the summer blockbusters, and then I'm taking a break from that sort of thing for a little while, um, at least until Big Hero 6 comes out and then The Hobbit. Uh, besides that, um, in, really, you're sold on Big Hero Six, huh? I'm gonna take my kid to go see it, so if I so if I do that, I might as well review the thing. Um, Fair point. Uh, Thursday coming up this week, uh, Sean Comer and I will review uh, volumes two and three of uh, Batman the Animated Series. Yay! We'll do a long show and get it all done this time, um, so that we can move on to bigger and better things. And um, Hopefully, depending on Pat's schedule, we'll be doing some live commentary of uh, UFC 1. What are we up to now? 77? 77. Yeah. Or um, still a shot, too. Even less buys. Yeah. I want to do live commentary for that. 
but uh, you know you're covering it, and yeah, Pat's got to be available. So that's that's in the that's in the maybe pile. Um, outside of that, I think it's all I got. All right. As for me, Mark mentioned my shows. This one every Friday, everyone loves a bad guy. Next week, it's either going to be kind of a look at functionally WCW. There will be a little bit of uh, Jim Crockett promotions time frame before it became you know the TBS juggernaut. Or ECW, depending on availability of people willing to talk about one of those two promotions in their functional entirety. So either of those, I'll have a uh, note out during the week as to which one it'll be. Hope you can all tune in and enjoy that. Should be a lot of fun. Also, every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, I host the 411 Ground and Pound radio show. If you're an MMA fan, I'd like to think of it as a must-listen. Myself, usually Jeff Harris. Talking about news, fights, fight cards, upcoming, all that good stuff. This week we'll be reviewing UFC Fight Nights 48 and 49. One headlined by Michael Bisbing and Kung Lee. The other headlined by Benson Henderson and Rafael Dos Anjos. I have coverage this Saturday evening of Henderson versus Dos Anjos, so stop by, say hello. There might be a picture of a voodoo priest in the form of Papa Shango. There might be chickens. You never know. It's MMA. Any of this could happen. So, uh, And if you happen to be awake early, like 5 Eastern, round about then, stop by because Larry Zonk is covering the Bisbing versus Lee event, and he could use some help trying to stay awake and stay focused during what I'm sure is going to be just a night of bleh. Because, again, international events. Hit and miss. And Mark plugged the rest of the shows on the network. Uh, my current article, again, if you're an MMA fan, the MMA Zone of 411mania.com is kind of where I hang out. I look at the fact that this week that Benson Henderson has to be impressive. Elsewise, he shall become another version of John Fitch or Rich Franklin. Hang on. We don't need... forgot to call the Weasley show. Oh, yeah. Every, what is it, every other Wednesday? I think they're, they're going a weekly very soon. So just every Wednesday. All right. Jason Beasley, Jesse Starcher, Robert Cooper, and with, uh, you know, everyone's favorite sport, not mine, but everyone else's, uh, American-style football kicking off pretty soon. We've just got preseason right now. If you're a fan of that stuff, uh, they've got a good show. Be sure to check that out. Uh, It's very rarely a waste of your time. That's going to wrap us up. That's all the shows. Mark, thanks for being on. We can revisit the Attitude Era at some point when you're not on such a tight schedule and we can just talk about all the goofiness because there was still the goofiness. It is pro wrestling. I will <laughs> see you all back here next week. So I got to find my outro sign. Where is it? There it is. Okay. Found it. All right. That's going to wrap us up tonight. Thank you all so very much for joining us. Same time, same place next week. Hope to see you then. So until then for Mark Radlich, who is about to remove his pants because pants are evil. I'm Robert Winfrey, reminding you all to be well, be safe. No, sorry, wrong outro. Reminding you all that without a villain, your hero is just a guy in tights who looks funny. Be aware of that, everybody. I'll see you next week. So say goodnight to the bad guy.